I'd now like to invite Dr. Nathan Bray, um, who um, is a research fellow for Bangor Un uh, University's Centre for Health Economics and Medicines Evaluation and is also an associate editor of the BJD. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you very much for um, inviting me here today and uh, particularly for following those two ec excellent lectures. Uh, my daughter is a massive fan of marine biology and she currently has head lice, so absolutely <laughs> relevant for me. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about health economics today. Um, I'm going to talk about how it's relevant to dermatology, um, some of the research that's been, con been conducted, but primarily I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to what health economics is and what it is that we do as health economists and how it can influence uh, practice. So um, I'm a, a health economist at Bangor University and I'm also a, a lecturer in healthcare improvement. Um, so I kind of straddle both sides of uh, looking at healthcare improvement in general and also looking at specifically uh, health economics. So um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the prevalence of skin conditions. I know you probably all know a lot more about this than I do, but uh, worth talking about this in terms of the relationship between this and cost. So over half of the UK population has uh, some sort of skin condition, and for children, this um, relates to about a third of all childhood diseases, um, and about 20% of all children have uh, eczema alone. Um, skin conditions have a major impact on people's everyday life, not only in terms of doing their normal activities, but also in terms of their ability to work and be productive. Uh, we know that hand eczema is one of the most common cause causes of um, disablement benefits in the UK, and uh, severe skin conditions, such as severe psoriasis, can cause major disruptions to people's productivity and increase the absenteeism, with some people um, spending as many as 26 days off work each year because of severe uh, skin conditions. So how does this relate to the cost of treatment for uh, the NHS? Well, um, actually, in, as, a, as a proportion of, uh, of, the, of the NHS budget spend, 2% uh, of it is spent on skin conditions, which is not a massive amount considering the prevalence, but in terms of the actual amount of money that's spent um, between 1.5 and 2 billion pounds per year, you can see it's a, it's a significant amount of money which is spent treating skin conditions. And this is likely to be much higher if we consider uh, the cost of wound management um, and uh, the treatment of comorbidities associated with wounds, uh, which covers about 5 billion pounds of the uh, NHS budget each year. And neither of these costs actually factor in uh, the wider costs associated with uh, treatment of um, uh, psychosocial issues associated with dermatology. And we know that about 85% of people with a skin condition say that uh, their skin condition has a significant and uh, detrimental impact on their everyday life. So how does this equate to um, particular parts of the NHS? Well, about 13 million people see their GP each year with a skin condition which equates to about 111 hours of, of GP time for each GP per year spent uh, simply on, on, tr on uh, seeing people with a skin condition. And this equates to about £700 million spent on primary care consultations alone. Um, of those 13 million people, around 900,000 will be referred on to a dermatologist, um, and this equates to about 2.7 4 million consultations per year in the UK. Uh, and the burden of cost is not only uh, on the NHS, but also on the patients themselves. Um, about 70% of people with a skin condition will uh, practice self-treatment, and they will spend £400 million each year on over-the-counter skin treatments, which is about 18% of the over-the-counter pur purchases of, uh, of, um, of medicines and, and drugs. So as we can see, the burden on cost is actually quite high, um, not only for the NHS, but for the patients. And this is really important because we know that not only um, do they suffer with a skin condition, but they also have the other uh, psychosocial impacts, the psychodermatology issues as well. So um, as health economists, how can we, uh, what work can we do to help um, you know, make sure that the money that is being spent is being done so in the best way possible and with the, ve the, ve the best value for money being achieved? Well. I guess if we take it back, so the NHS is 71 tomorrow, and it was set up uh, by the then Prime Minister, Nye Bevan, on, uh, based on this egalitarian principle of universal health care for all, regardless of, the, of, of how much you can, you can afford health care, um, and making sure that you know, people have equitable and fair access. He's uh, famously stated as saying that no society can legitimately call itself civilised if a sick person is denied medical aid because of a lack of means. Um, but how do we finance a healthcare system so that we can provide this sort of egalitarian universal coverage? 
uh, it's obviously quite a difficult thing to do, particularly uh, doing it in a way which uh, the majority of the public feel like the, the, their tax funding is being used in the most appropriate way possible. And this is where the role of the health economist comes in, in, in allowing uh, evidence to guide provision um, around what's the most efficient and cost-effective use of, of funding. So, um, so what exactly is health economics? Well, it's the study of scarcity and choice in healthcare. We examine um, resource use, efficiency, and value of healthcare. We study the relationship between supply, demand, and consumption of healthcare treatments and services. And we use um, a, a range of tools and analytical techniques which fall under the umbrella of economic evaluation to determine how cost-effective a treatment or service is, and therefore to determine how, uh, how much value for money it is. There are sort of some key uh, components of health economics. Um, and these sort of the, fall into five uh, general topics, and these are that firstly, demand for healthcare is infinite. And we don't mean that it goes on forever and ever, but essentially because we know that resources are scarce, that there isn't unlimited money going into uh, healthcare services, that people's demand for healthcare will always be higher than the resources that are available to provide healthcare. And this is partly down to people's increasing expectations about what um, services can provide, and also for the fact that people are living longer and living longer with chronic illness as well. So because uh, demand is high, resources are scarce, we need to be able to make choices between different competing alternatives in healthcare in terms of treatment services and also in terms of treatment mix within services. And how do we do that? Well, it, it can be very difficult um, and really we have to establish a way to prioritize different treatments and services. And in order to do this, we need to be able to understand how much they cost, but also how much we get out of them in terms of health outcomes and health benefits for the patients. So um, why do we need health economics as a separate branch of economics? Well, essentially health economics is, uh, is, is a form of applying uh, methods of economics and economic evaluation to healthcare as a distinct uh, uh, market of goods and services. But there's a, there are many reasons why health economics has to be a separate branch in that the market of, of health is not uh, like a typical market in terms of uh, you know, typical market goods, economics, and, and so on. Um, this is down to a number of reasons. Firstly, the asymmetry of information between patients and uh, doctors or uh, buyers and sellers of, of, of healthcare. We have um, issues in, in terms of uh, the uncertainty of health and healthcare. We don't know how long we're going to be ill for, when we're going to get, going to get ill. And patients don't understand what treatments they need until they see their GP, which creates some, uh, some, some difficulties in applying typical approaches to market economics. So because people are living longer and accessing more healthcare, we need health economists to help us uh, make sure we're making the right decisions in terms of which services and treatments to, um, to support. Now the role of the health economist is to feed into the agenda of quality improvement and so on. It's not necessarily to lead it, but to provide evidence which helps people to make decisions, policymakers, commissioners and so on, to make the best decisions with the available resource they have to them. And this has to be done in a way which is fair and equitable and also reflects societal values for how public money should be spent. So um, if we think about a quality improvement agenda, this is a typical one from the Institute of Medicine, um, which states that the quality improvement in healthcare is, is based around six attributes, um, equity, safety, timeliness, patient-centeredness, efficiency, and effectiveness. And really where the health economist feeds into this is in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, in terms of the work that we do around looking at treatment costs, resource allocation, conducting economic evaluations, looking at social return on investment, patient preferences, and so on. So as you can see, we can use a range of, of, of skills and tools to help us feed into the overall quality improvement agenda within the NHS and also at health services um, across the world. So really the key thing for the health economist is looking at efficiency or the relationship between inputs and outputs. Now you might think because we are classed as economists that we might only care about um, the inputs, the, the financial input into the service. But if we only look at the inputs and we don't really understand how efficient something is. For instance, if we have two drugs which cost, uh, one of them costs more than the other, if we're only looking at the inputs, we might um, uh, reasonably assume uh, that the cheaper drug is more efficient and therefore that should be one that is funded. But if the more costly drug um, also provides a lot more health outcomes and health benefits, then therefore down the line it would actually be the better use of money and therefore be more efficient. Um, and that's why it's so important that we measure the relationship between costs and benefits and also that we define our outcomes in a way which is clinically relevant or in a way which is universally relevant across different treatments and services, which I'll go into a little bit um, in a minute. So 
as an example, a real-world example of what efficiency looks like, um, if we look at America, and sorry to, to bash America again today, I know we've already had uh, one, <laughs> one joke about them, but um, essentially, if we look at spending per capita on healthcare in different uh, nations across the world, what we see is America spends far more than any other developed nation, uh, more, more than double that of the UK. Now, we might not assume that they would get uh, double the health outcomes that, the, that we get in the UK, but we would certainly expect for the amount of money they're spending that we would get better outcomes in America. But the reality is that when we look at the key indicators of population health, we see that America is lagging far behind in terms of things like average life expectancy, um, uh, birth weight of children, and infant mortality rates, and a range of other indicators. And this is not to denigrate America or the healthcare system, but to point out that actually simply spending more money on a healthcare system does not necessarily mean that you're going to get better outcomes because the relationship between input and output is so important and the efficiency of the, of the services, the, the, the key driving force behind how we should make our services better and improve outcomes for patients. So as a health economist, what is it that we can do to uh, feed into the agenda of quality improvements on a practical level? Well, we conduct things uh, such as uh, conduct uh, analyses like economic evaluation. And economic evaluation is a framework for, uh, or an umbrella term for a range of different techniques such as cost-benefit analysis, cost-effectiveness analysis, cost-minimization analysis, and so on. Um, so there are some, some common commonalities between different types of economic evaluation. Uh, they are almost always a, a, a competition between two competing alternatives, so trying to decide um, which choice is the best in terms of uh, the relationship between cost and benefits. They're always associated with costs and benefits, but how we define costs and benefit will, will be determined by the type of economic evaluation work that we are, that we are conducting. Um, and the primary goal of all economic evaluations is to generate the maximum benefits for the use of the scarce resources that are available. So we spoke, I spoke a little bit about outcomes before, and obviously we can use clinically relevant outcomes uh, to determine um, cost effectiveness. But when it comes to looking at um, the, the mixture across a range of different treatments and services and, and trying to make comparisons across disparate services which aren't naturally comparable, for instance, it's very difficult to equate the cost per leg amputation avoided to the cost per cataract removed. It's it, almost impossible to, to compare those two things because they're not uh, relative on the same scale. Um, so we have to use universal approaches to measuring outcomes. And this is where the idea of the quality adjusted life year or the quality came from. And I'm sure many of you have heard of the quality before. Um, I, it's reported in many uh, cost effects analysis and in NICE guidance and so on. Um, but essentially the, the, the quality is uh, based on the idea that um, at its core, healthcare is about either improving someone's quality of life, extending their quantity of life, or doing a bit of both. So essentially, if, if, if a um, healthcare treatment or service to be classed as being um, effective, if it improves someone's quantity or quality of life or both, then therefore that would be a relatively good proxy for, um, for health outcomes. So what exactly is a quality? Oh, it's, a, it's an aggregate of both quantity and quality of life. It's calculated by multiplying the length of time spent in a given uh, health state by the quality of life of that particular health state during that, during that time. Um, it's... Uh, it's essentially like a universal approach or theoretically a uni universal approach that allows us to look at outcomes that are uh, comparable across lots of different treatments and services. Um, they're generic and um, they essentially measure, measure disease burden, but they use patient preference, uh, sorry, uh, general public preferences to help decide whether or not health states are um, uh, the desirability of them for different, uh, uh, different health states across a spectrum of quality of life and quantity of life. So the reason that um, qualities have become so important in, in the UK in particular in terms of economic evaluation um, is because of, uh, essentially because they've been advocated uh, for by the uh, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE. Um, now NICE provides independent guidance to the NHS, uh, social care and so on, about which treatments and services should be funded. And they do this based on um, a synthesis of the most relevant evidence and then also through uh, meeting of, of uh, committees and, and uh, looking at the evidence and considering uh, not only the effectiveness and safety and so on, but also the cost effectiveness. And they advocate the use of the quality as a primary outcome measure in their cost effectiveness analyses. And this is conducted in what we call a cost utility analysis, uh, which is based on the patient preference data, uh, the, sorry, the general public, public data, which is incorporated into the quality calculations. So theoretically, the quality allows a universal approach to outcome measurements and thus provides a single metric which, by which to assess cost effectiveness. Uh, and NICE states a uh, 
cost effectiveness threshold of about 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality gained. Um, and anything that is above 30,000 pounds would not be considered cost effective and therefore wouldn't be funded generally. Um, this is often broken in end of life treatments and cancer treatments. Um, but in general, that 30,000 pound is, is, is the upper limit. Um, anything below 20,000 pounds per quality gained would be classed as, uh, as, as pretty much straightforwardly uh, cost effective and anything between 20 and 30 would, would require some discussion with the committee um, and uh, some expert opinion to, to make some decisions. So if we look at NICE guidance uh, for skin conditions, um, they published 85 recommendations relating to skin conditions, 47 of which have utilized quality evidence to help determine whether or not the treatment or service was classed as cost effective and therefore supporting their guidance and decisions on uh, you know, which, uh, whether or not something should be incorporated into, uh, into typical NHS practice. You can see that uh, the majority of these um, recommendations have been relating to skin cancer and psoriasis, but then there have been a few relating to um, other skin conditions, wound management, eczema, and diabetic foot. So if we look at a specific example in terms of psoriasis, so we know that psoriasis costs the NHS about 80 million pounds per year in terms of treating patients. Um, NICE has published 23 sets of guidance relating to psoriasis treatments, 18 of which have incorporated quality estimates in the, into their cost effectiveness uh, decisions. And these have predominantly been related to biologic treatments. Um, as an example, so this is one of the most highly cited um, NICE guidance uh, relating to psoriasis treatment, which is um, the infliximab guidance from 2008. And essentially what they found um, from the evidence and through discussion within the committee was that infliximab was uh, clinically effective to treat severe psoriasis because it was more rapid and longer lasting in terms of response compared to the alternatives, but it, it was also really expensive and costing about £12,000 per patient per year. And essentially what they found was that if you consider all patients with psoriasis, it wouldn't be a cost-effective use of money because the cost per quality was falling well outside that £30,000 threshold. But if you considered only for the most severe cases, uh, what you found was that it actually was a relatively cost-effective approach compared to um, the alternatives, um, and therefore that it could be recommended for use in the most severe, severe cases of psoriasis. And this is an example of where something is, um, is more effective, but because its cost is so high, it becomes uh, that, it, that threshold, that, that uh, relationship between cost and benefit becomes quite tight. Um, and this is kind of the most interesting thing that, that, that we get in, in health economists is really looking at that balance between cost and benefit. So um, in conclusion, um, health economics provides an opportunity to analyze and optimize the efficiency of health services. Um, we use economic evaluation um, uh, a lot in, in a range of different conditions and it's being used more and more within dermatology. Um, and my advice is that with any, any RCTs that are being started to embed health economics within that from the very, very start so that you can use the best, best methods and the best techniques possible to uh, get the economic data that you need. Um, it's important to consider, particularly within dermatology, the reality of practice in terms of the effectiveness and efficacy of a treatment. Um, this can include um, you know, the, the, the treatment order, um, dropout rates, uh, other resource use that's associated with the costs of, of a treatment or service. Um, and finally, health economists don't uh, they only feed into the sort of the cost effectiveness um, evidence, but we can also feed into other areas in terms of things like determining patient preferences for different treatments and services, conducting social return on investment so we can understand uh, how much we get in terms of social value um, for every pound that we spend on a healthcare treatment or service. And then we can also do things like budget impact analysis and so on. So uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, my contact details are there. Thank you very much.